Okay. Thanks. And I, I think we have a very good transition from the discussion in the first session, as, as Elspieta observed, uh, and that, 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 uh, to, to the topic of the current session, which is the interplay uh, between the centralized state power and local powers, local governments, something which we have seen very well in Poland. Uh, and. Uh, 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 actually, now uh, I think Helena will mention it in her presentation, but I, I just wanted to mention that uh, the mayor of Warsaw uh, has entered the presidential race just a few days ago in Poland, and it seems to be a big change in the uh, in the current situation. So, uh, uh, because he has uh, mayors of major cities behind him. But the, the, that attack also on local governments was, was uh, at the same time a feature of this uh, uh, quality of, of authoritarianism to extend centralized power. Uh, and it was also happening again, as we saw from Poland uh, uh, in, in the Polish context of increased pressure and attacks against local governments uh, f during during the pandemic so i i think that we have a very very important and interesting session uh, in front of us and uh, again um i would ask uh, uh, everyone who is scheduled to speak in this session to make really brief introductory remarks rather just just highlight some points for discussion so that uh, uh, everybody can join in, and we can we can uh, we can have really uh, uh, a good debate rather than a series of presentations. So I will I will ask first Helena Chmielewska Schleifer uh, to talk about authoritarian appetites versus local solidarity, and and uh, uh, I, I understand based on the Polish uh, Polish uh, case and situation. So Helena, please. Thank you. Um, so I will not really talk about my paper because I assume that you've seen it. Um, and even if you haven't, then I will not mention it much, but I will take out some of the highlights and a lot has been changing in the recent days, even less than a week in Poland. So it's kind of constantly updated. Um, and, uh, the major argument of my short article, which was actually published in Polish um, at the beginning of May in Respublika magazine, um, is that there is a kind of schizophrenic relation between how people feel and are able to act on a local level in their immediate environments, whether this be their towns or their neighborhoods, um, and um, the um, sense of helplessness towards central government. And uh, this, this clash is noticeable, particularly in Poland, but based on the papers that I've read, this is also something that can be noticed in Hungary, in Slovakia, and probably some other places as well, probably the US and, and to some extent. So um, a, a question I can start with is how do you translate this sense of um, agency and and this uh, act, those individual acts of um, of, of of help of support uh, to people in need, but also to kind of strengthening uh, the way that lo localities are governed in something that is bigger that spreads um, elsewhere and not is not only limited to the, to those small environments. And uh, I'm looking at the political surveys for support, for party support and political support. And of course, uh, especially with the recent um, introduction of, of Rafał Trzaskowski, the, the Warsaw mayor to the presidential race, there has been, uh, there has been a change in uh, voter sympathies for the presidential candidates, but nonetheless, the current incumbent president Duda from Law and Justice Party is still heading the race. And so there is a question, what really needs to happen more for people to actually change their minds? And as Pavel mentioned before, the major issue is economic standing of individuals. 
Uh, but at the same time, we can see and in Poland and elsewhere how successful, um, I, I don't remember who mentioned that in that paper, but I really like that this, this kind of separation between polit pol politics and policy making that uh, on the level of politics, the kind of ideological framework of what we can imagine is uh, extremely successful. So propaganda is more successful um, in influencing people uh, than their economic, direct economic reality. Still, we'll see what happens next. But nonetheless, there's, there's a huge issue of uh, people uh, making their minds who to vote, ho who to vote for, um, what, uh, what presidential candidates, what parties to stand by, um, and uh, there is, I like my hunch is that there is a um, strong belief that politicians in general are awful, and so um, people are not really that upset with law and justice because they're upset with everybody, and at least they know what law and justice is about. So the democratic values are enacted where people actually feel they have some sort of power. But the question is, how do you translate that local power or sense of local power into a bigger national scale? And, and you know, this is something that I would like to have an answer for as well, but I don't. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I. Uh, I, I, I have a feeling that, uh, that uh, just like in the first session, we, we have these contrasting cases, especially from Poland and Hungary, which uh, is everyone likes to compare and to contrast. Uh, and so far, it's, uh, what we see is that uh, in Poland, the, the impact of pandemic seems to be more two ways. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it, it affects the state of, uh, sort of, it strengthens authoritarianism, but at the same time shows the cracks in the authoritarian uh, policies and, and the even support, I would argue. Uh, in Hungary, we have a, still more of a narrative of one way, that is the government going strong, and I'm just very interesting. The title of Christoph's paper seems to be running in the same direction that uh, curtailment of municipal power in Hungary, but I, I wonder if there are also some signs in Hungary that uh, uh, the, of the other process that is the undermining of cre credibility of central power and ch challenging it by successful local governments. I'm just so, Christoph, could you maybe uh, uh, respond to this? Uh, yeah, this sure. Question? Thanks for the question. I'll start with that then immediately. Um, I think that in some way this crisis really exposed the vulnerabilities um, of the government um, and presents a real challenge. And I know that Gabor will talk more about healthcare, um, but so just a sentence on that. I mean, the crisis arrived at a moment where this cri the health system has been severely underfunded, so it, or in a very critical state. So that really you know, put the government already on the back foot. And a lot of what they're doing resembles you know, the Polish government's attempt to rule the situation through propagandistic means. Um, and the, I think the other main vulnerability of the government um, was um, that it really couldn't allow itself to provide this kind of social assistance and spending that many other states, actually I would say most European states provide. Um, so there isn't this balancing act between supporting business and citizens who, are, who lose their jobs or are in vulnerable situations, but it's really just about helping the national bourgeoisie, so domestic capital and transnational capital, keep spinning the wheels of the economy and not giving anything basically to citizens. And I think that's a real risk that the government is taking and it may have to change its stance in the future. Um, I read the emergency law uh, in, on, along those lines as well as in, to some respect, a way to distract attention from the failures of policy and to create a symbolic issue around which its own voters can rally um, and which it can use to stigmatize opponents both inside and outside the country. 
but coming to the municipal level. I think here it's not really so much as a challenge that we see, but a real opportunity for the government in political terms. Um, and here I have to remind you that Hungary and Poland are in two totally different political situations. We are after an important election, which was held in the fall of 2019. It was the local elections, the municipal elections, which resulted in a lot of urban bastions being taken over by a much more united opposition. So for the first time in Hungary, after nine years of Fidesz power, you see some really important shift in political dynamics with the opposition coming to some kind of not unity, but strong cooperation, which represents a challenge to the, to the current regime. And what the, the government has been doing is using the pandemic as an opportunity to clamp down on the municipal level, because here really in the next few years, the political battle is going to be between a centralized government, which has a lot of power, as you all know, and local municipalities, which are run by the, by the opposition. And that's almost 4 million people being ruled by the opposition now. So very briefly, what the government has done is, um, I mean, the first thing is political opportunism, which is do a couple of things which distracted people don't pay so much attention to these days. And um, one of them was uh, actually, there's a huge uh, South Korean investment close to Budapest, which was hindered by the local opposition municipality and the government basically introduced a rule, uh, a decree, sorry, which took um, the territory of this factory out of the control of the municipality. So they can no longer block Samsung from doing whatever it wants to there. Um, so that's one of the things, um, political opportunism. But the other thing is that they really, um, what they're doing is, um, I told you that they didn't really um, help uh, people in need. And actually I think it serves the government's purposes of pushing social problems onto municipalities. I see that I live in the, one of the poorest municipalities of the, of the capital and I really see um, already the effects of the pandemic around me. And who do people turn to? The local mayor who is in the opposition and who has no money actually to support these people because not only has the government not provided extra funds to municipalities but has actually taken further money away. Legitimizing this by saying, um, well, we all have to sh pitch in, you know, this is a crisis situation. Everyone needs to tighten their belts and so do municipalities. So what I'm saying basically is that there is an enforced program of austerity, which will prevent the opposition from building from the ground up its political alternative, the way Fidesz did after losing the elections of 2002. Very important, I think, to remind us that Fidesz won the elections of 2010 through painstaking eight years of work from municipalities upwards. So here's where I see the main battle lines. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating. But it, uh, it's, uh, uh, again, as I remarked, I have a sense that the, the battle is not a one-way, I mean, the pandemic is not one-way street for authoritarianism, that the, there, is, uh, there is resistance, even though it creates opportunities. And uh, another fascinating case, uh, Turkey and Utku uh, uh, submitted paper on urban politics and pandemic in Turkey. So once, once again, uh, I think our crucial a uh, crucial uh, uh, question, uh, I think, in this session would be uh, if we agree that pandemics provides opportunity for authoritarian governments to further increase their power, uh, is there any hope that uh, it will also provide local governments with increased resilience to fight these tendencies? So, Utku, would you like to, to comment and refer to this question in the context of your paper, please? Uh, yeah, yeah Jake, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think I have uh, much to add to what uh, Helena and Christoph said with regard to this you know, competition. Uh, it's, it's, I say, I mean, um, a very similar let's say, process is going on in Turkey. Uh, some sort of a competition between municipalities and the central government uh, is being um, just, you know, uh, is unfolding. And has been actually unfolding uh, for the last year because in 2019, the Islamist government in Turkey for the first time lost Istanbul and Ankara, the two biggest cities in the country. And this gave uh, hope to the opposition. Um, uh, and then uh, the central government, the Islamist government, basically um, began to put pressure 
uh, on this municipal government. Uh, and one of the things they did, I'd say, is to just make them as invisible as possible. And this pandemic, uh, ironically, basically gave this opportunity to these municipalities to just, um, let's say, uh, pursue their own PR campaigns. I don't think neither the central government nor the municipal governments in Turkey are uh, um, taking the right steps against this coronavirus pandemic. It's much more about, again, the PR campaigns on both sides. Uh, and but and municipalities but now have this you know let's say um, uh, advantage because they say the central government has a much bigger is a responsibility and they are basically failing uh, and the municipalities basically just um, 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 have more opportunity to do whatever they want to do without you know uh, uh, taking the most of the burden uh, to fight against the pandemic. And the reason is that, especially since 2011, the central government, again, the Islamist government, took progressive steps to centralize the social uh, policy measures. Accordingly, there was this you know, dilemma. I mean, they just wanted to take you know, more power to, in their hands uh, within the last decade, and then, the, but with power also comes the responsibility. Having said that, you know, there's another thing. So like, you know, almost half of the population right now in Turkey lives in cities governed by uh, the main opposition party at the municipal level. So in other words, you know, they say there is a lot of, you know, they say, um, I think that there is, you know, like uh, new there are new possibilities. There's a prospect you know, for the opposition to use this, you know, like ongoing pandemic. I'm not uh, pessimistic either. Uh, and I just would like to put this uh, ordeal uh, in its historical context. I mean, your question is that if we see any hope, you know, during this pandemic with regard to the, uh, let's say, um, uh, steps taken by the municipal governments run, run by the opposition, I say, if you believe in the power of the deja vu, the answer is yes. Because at the end of the day, the Islamist government in Turkey came to power in 1994 in Istanbul and Ankara, and then won the elections in 2002, uh, right after a major earthquake uh, in the, a city just you know, uh, very close to Istanbul in 1999. Istanbul was also severely hit by the earthquake, but uh, the city neighboring Istanbul hosted the major industrial lesser facilities of the country. According to after the earthquake, the Turkish economy was severely hit by uh, the uh, rupture of uh, this economic growth. And two years uh, after we had this major crisis in 2001, 1991, 2001, and in 2002, Islamists uh, basically came to power. According to I think Islamists in power are now shocked by this development at the very basic social psychological level because they feel like, you know, a, the similar story is just being run. Uh, it's a very similar story, again, to what we had you know, like in the 1990s. I think that kind of, let's say, emotional stress may just cause them to take, you know, again, let's say, successively progressive wrong uh, steps, uh, probably put ex uh, extreme pressure on this uh, municipalities of these two big cities of Turkey, and it may have the potential to backfire. Um, and in this, you know, like larger context, I say uh, there is a lot of this space to just work on uh, at the municipal level. I agree with you and uh, the uh, points of other the other two presenters, uh, but we need to uh, certainly work on how to they say um, what kind of a discourse maybe we can present, you know, to this you know local let's say politicians and local political movements, uh, so that you know they can just you know find a way. Uh, to just uh, cope with the um, possibly increasing pressure by the central governments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I I, I just uh, received information that Daniel is some has some problems with connection. Is uh, yeah. So well, let, let's let's uh, maybe ask Nazan and have two. Uh, two insights into Turkey situation, and then hopefully Daniel uh, will will come back to us and speak about uh, about Slovakia. So, uh, Nazan, please. Uh, thank the floor you. Is yours. Uh, the <laughs> thank the, you. the uh, question is: uh, I mean, we are talking about limits to authoritarian power, and uh, that what what the uh, uh, pandemic says about it in in. Uh, in this case, in the context between competition, let's say, between local and national, but please. Uh, 
Well, I think I'm a bit less uh, optimistic than uh, Utsko, but um, for sure there is there 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 is an opportunity for. Uh, uh, for resistance at the time, because uh, in Turkey, as in most other places, you know, the government keeps uh, fighting his usual battles, you know, and using the pandemic to insert more pressure. Um, but um, one thing that might make us uh, a bit hopeful is that they do not have any repertoire, you know, because they're like trying to run things with business as usual, uh, because it has always been working for those in power. So, like the Turkish government still keeps uh, conducting the military operations in Syria and Libya, but uh, for for the power of the local, uh, you know, municipalities and the uh, communities, I would say the earlier trend of decentralization, which was part of the long gone EU process, EU accession process in Turkey, is totally eliminated right now. Utku mentioned the uh, opposition uh, municipalities in the west. Uh, what happens in the eastern part of Turkey right now is that since 2016, the central government um, keeps removing the elected mayors, predominantly in Kurdish towns, and replaces them with uh, appointed governors. You know, and, uh, and I feel like it also lets the opposition municipalities in the west, in the western part of Turkey, to operate within a limit that is defined by the government. So Erdogan's usual uh, strategy to bet on political futures uh, um, over the last decade, uh, which I can define as governing by creating senses of emergencies, you know, uh, and um, you know, al always putting a date ahead of us in the coming months or within a year uh, that the general public is looking forward to. This could be elections, a referendum, military operations in Syria, a day to send all the refugees to Europe. You know, public is always looking for something so that, uh, and this also lets the government and Erdogan to make the rules of the game, right? It all creates some sense of hope in the opposition that this time they might have a chance. And uh, if you hop on the board of this expectation, you're also acting in terms of um, an acceptable opposition to in Turkey. However, I agree with uh, most of you thinking that this crisis might be larger that they can handle because it's not premeditated by the government this time. This is not premeditated by Erdogan, by Erdogan. So it could create a unique opportunity for the progressives to expose the inefficiencies of this regime. And, uh, but also I think coming to the central power, the, the uh, the power already accumulated in, in the central government. You know, Erdogan was already equipped with extensive and extraordinary powers since the failed coup d'etat in Turkey in 2016. Officially, the state of emergency was lifted in 2018, but in practice, it became the new normal. Uh, nonetheless, similar to others, he didn't pass the opportunity to use the pandemic. And of course, there are unsurprising parallels between um, what you call, what Jacek calls um, the politics of parallel reality, you know, the PR campaign about the success of fight against the pandemic in Turkey, coupled with uh, the narrative of failed governments el elsewhere, especially in the United States. And also um, what Andrej, Andrej um, highlighted, governing by degree, so legal uncertainties and arbitrariness, this is the new normal. And also similar to what uh, Christo said about Hungary, the priority is to keep the economy working. So, so putting all these together, I am a bit less optimistic, I would say, because you know he's he's prioritizing opening the malls in Turkey instead of let's say parks, seasides, and there's a very discrim discriminatory and arbitrary uh, form of curfew in Turkey right now for those over 65 and below uh, 20, they cannot go outside. Um, only uh, once in every two weeks for four hours or something like that. And, uh, and also, again, part of his usual political battles, blaming on the LGBTQI community or the refugees or the coup letters if there's something wrong in Turkey, including the pandemic. But as I said, the, the, they are using the same repertoire. They're not coming up with original uh, methods. So this could be an opportunity for the progressives in Turkey maybe to come up with more um, creative solutions. As much as this whole new online meeting world 
creates uh, issues of accessibility, you know, uh, problems of accessibility. I think it also created, it was already there, but it made it more uh, prevalent, you know, the, the uh, methods of coming together in, in, in other places. Since public space, you know, the real public space is closed, we could, if you could even try making use of this new uh, virtual public space, maybe at least to brainstorm about new possibilities. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think that, that there are some points you made that I would like to highlight and one is very interesting about using all these the same tool books and that these populist authoritarians, they have a, a effective but rather limited toolbox uh, and they uh, use it effectively when uh, they managing with problems that they control or often created like funny problems, but this this crisis is actually testing their powers and their efficiency and especially in case of governments that have been quite centralized before the crisis that uh, puts a burden of responsibility additional burden of responsibility and creates uh, opportunity uh, for uh, for the opposition uh, i wonder if daniel is is back with us and it's uh, i don't I don't see him, so uh, maybe uh, maybe I will I will invite everybody now to uh, either ask questions or uh, actually maybe uh, to uh, to talk about this this key question about how the uh, sort of local power and centralized power plays out in the crisis. I mean, I I think we would be all very interested to hear. Uh, about the U.S. experience in this case, because here it's also a, 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 a something that that has been a feature of this crisis. Uh, but so, please, who would uh, who would uh, maybe you should indicate on chat that you would like to 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 speak now? Oh, Isaac, I see. Yeah. Hi. Do this is great. Uh, you're doing, everyone's doing a great job. Uh, thank you to everybody. A fascinating bunch of papers, and you're really doing an excellent job of identifying the key questions. So obviously, a lot of these same dynamics play out in the U.S. Uh, they play out both, uh, I'll just be really brief here. They play out both with regard to federalism issues and with regard to this, basically the structuring of national politics. So with regard to federalism, we see this playing out. Um, a lot of the most, let's just say, progressive responses to the crisis in this country have come from democratic states led by democratic governors like Cuomo, New, uh, Gavin Newsom in California, uh, Whitmer in Michigan, etc. They're not all democratic governors. And there have been some Republican governors who've really dissented from Trump, which has also been interesting. But there is this tension and in fact, uh, the Republican Party nationally and Trump is making a big deal about this and trying to blame the state governments and also trying to uh, treat them as kind of exempl uh, examples of liberalism run amok. So uh, at the same time, even in terms of the structuring of national politics, for example, uh, the big states, the, the, the blue, uh, which also tend to be blue states, okay, in the US, um, are states that have an incredible amount of the wealth of the country. Um, and in fact, in terms of public policy at the national level, there's kind of like a redistribution of wealth. Cuomo made a big deal about this. The fact that in fact, New York state contributes more to the federal budget than it gets out of the federal budget. But because of the Senate and other institutions in the national government that overrepresent uh, underpopulated areas that tend to be more conservative, even national policy is skewed to the right. So anyway, the point is this plays out in very interesting and complicated ways in the US. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think Lash, Professor Laszlo Brust wanted to make a comment, so please. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I, this was fascinating, uh, uh, and uh, actually I wanted also to hear about this uh, federalism uh, 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 and systems that don't have any kind of uh, uh, local political uh, power, uh, uh, self-governments, and uh, 
uh, from the perspective of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, uh, US still uh, seems to be a, a robust uh, system of defenses for the local uh, democracies and local uh, uh, policymakers. So I see ISEC what uh, you see as a problem from a US perspective, but that's uh, uh, a paradise from the perspective of uh, countries that don't have, uh, uh, just have the central states. Uh, and uh, uh, what I, I think Christoph's uh, uh, intervention was excellent, exactly because it could show uh, what's going on uh, in these countries, uh, strengthening uh, actually uh, processes uh, uh, that uh, started actually already before the, the Fidesz uh, uh, regime uh, started. Uh, I would call it uh, uh, even stronger than what Christoph said. I would say this uh, politics of, of of, of constructing helplessness, constructing local helplessness, and, and misusing and using for strengthening the power. So it's, it was very, uh, it's very important that he stressed that the, the, this is uh, uh, regaining uh, 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 something that uh, the opposition took away uh, from uh, Fidesz uh, in the 2019 elections. And uh, Fidesz consciously uh, tries to create a situation in which uh, uh, local uh, authorities and local governments will not be able to uh, solve problems, that even address problems, uh, and create uh, 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 the need uh, to go uh, for central help. And it can use uh, now the EU monies, it can use uh, the relaxation of uh, state aid rules and many other things. Actually, uh, uh, it's a very paradox way how the EU uh, monies and the EU regulations will strengthen now this kind of centralizing and the uh, use of uh, uh, constructed helplessness. Thank you so much. Uh, who would also like to address this issue at this moment? Uh, please. Uh, so I see Elspeta and, and I want to speak. Uh -huh. to. So I, what I wanted to say uh, has something, has plenty to do with what we are doing, what, what, is, what is happening right now, but also quite a bit of what had happened many years ago. And I think we have to keep it in mind and, and kind of think about it if you know, new opportunities will come to reimagine and reshape, um, uh, perhaps not to return, but restart um, uh, democracy. I wanted to, I wanted to very briefly talk uh, about the reform of local self-government and actually in Poland, which was designed uh, which was envisioned in late 70s, which was by in the, under, in the, in the opposition and under, the underground, which was um, uh, designed to really, um, and that what was in people's head at the time, uh, break a monopoly of, a, of omnipotent state through a very specific shift of policy regarding, um, among other matters, and I think it's important, budgetary matters. Um, local self-government, not just large municipalities, have their own budgets, right? So um, other matters such as public expenditures, accountability, and 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 government uh, governance over over um, over public um, over public uh, services, um, and that and what had happened is that because this stuff was already ready, and I'm talking about it because I think we we have to think about future. Um, uh, one of the very first um, uh, um, acts, parliamentary acts, uh, in 1990, um, 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 when the government was run by, uh, by Prime Minister Mazowiecki, was to pass this extraordinary reform. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and I think that uh, the differences that we see the big city is a separate thing, but the differences that we see uh, b between um, uh, what Helena was describing uh, uh, very interestingly is kind of a sites of hope where, where things can ha are happening because people feel that they have impact on, on their daily lives and they can actually see what power means, is that that is that what differs, that, that level of decentralization, which the government is of course trying to lock out, uh, is um, what what makes a difference between I think Poland and Hungary, certainly Poland and South Africa. You know, I mean, when 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 and all those other places where 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 people are deployed by the central government to the to the to municipalities to run them stuff for them. I just I'm just mentioning this as an important element that uh, I hope that at some point we are going to talk about what 
you know, how can one indeed reimagine that future? And then that should be one of the moments, I think. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you wanted to make Yes, I'd like to say or... something about this. I mean, you know, sitting here in New York, the, uh, the center of the global pandemic, uh, I thank uh, the founding fathers for federalism. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there's a sense in which um, not only my governor, uh, Cuomo, but the governors in the neighboring states are all acting in a rational, and I should say also democratic fashion, and uh, though I feel uh, under threat uh, and personally unsafe uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, politically disempowered by uh, the central authority and Trump, uh, I feel um, uh, defended uh, by the more local authorities. I, th I think that's very, very important. Uh, and I think depending on where you are, this dynamic of the relationship between the local and the political uh, seems to actually uh, uh, come into play uh, in, e in many of our countries. I think, it, it, you know, having read your papers and reading about uh, your countries, I know this is true of our, for our colleagues in Central Europe, and it's also very much true uh, for um, uh, the people in, in Brazil. I think, though, that that a, a kind of uh, uh, I observe in the United States, and then I question about how it works elsewhere, uh, how these two powers interact. You know, how is it uh, that we who oppose Trump uh, can use the power generated by our local authorities to actually centrally challenge Trump? I think that that that's that's in uh, in fact the major political question of our times. So, you know, I, I think that Biden has to actually use the, the power and authority of, of the various governors and of the people he competed with to actually uh, empower him as he challenges Trump. And I think that uh, the same may be, is in fact true uh, 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 in other countries as well. So the local authorities can, local authority can provide uh, uh, a refuge, a crack, uh, uh, some safety from the irrationalities of the central of central authority, uh, uh, but actually, there's a question of how do you change the central authority? And 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 I think that uh, uh, specific, you know, my my pay, the the pieces that I've contributed to the seminar, we'll talk about it uh, uh, next uh, tomorrow. Uh, I think that actually media strategies, way people connect, I think what, what uh, um, Nazan pointed out, the, the, the using uh, uh, the, the kind of available media we have here to actually uh, act in concert and, and, and challenge uh, is uh, one of the challenges of our time. So like, how could it work in looking on my screen, I see Laszlo, could it work in Hungary uh, th that uh, the types of uh, municipal governances that exist as an alternative to the ruling party can uh, somehow be the base for challenging Fetus. Uh, I, I see Jacek shaking his head now. Mm -hmm. it, it is, I, I, actually, I didn't know what Helena reported, that, that apparently the mayor of, uh, uh, did I understand correctly, the mayor of Warsaw is uh, now running it. Right. Candidate. You know, that kind of uh, capacity to use this local authority, not only as a refuge from the, the uh, authoritarian centralization, but also a way of uh, democratically challenging. And I, th I think that that's, um, uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm hopeful in the United States. And uh, I wonder how uh, general uh, that hope is. Uh, yes, uh, indeed. I, I think this is that there are two questions here. It's one one uh, 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 question is how effective local governments are in pushing back the centralized oh. state, and the second is what you just raised: how they can empower the opposition to actually challenge authoritarianism on on a national level. So I, I think this is this is a great great question. So uh, now. Uh, uh, Samuel and uh, Elżbieta Korolczuk and Jeff Isaac. I think this is the, uh, the yeah, sequence. Um, yes, so. Hi, everyone. 
I just wanted to make a small contribution for uh, Slovakia because I think it's a bit of a curious case. Uh, like Michal said um, a few minutes ago, we had these elections basically right before the outbreak of uh, coronavirus. So, so what happened was that the 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 outgoing government they were just trying to you know let go and survive, and they thought, okay, we're we're done in ten days. We'll just wait we will not do anything but then the virus got too serious and because the central government didn't do anything they didn't act at all it was the local government who actually took action it was the local government here in Bratislava in the capital who were the first who said okay if the government is not shutting down schools then we are going to do it for for ourselves because it can go on like this so they were actually the first ones to start anything and then once the new government, after the elections, took power, they enforced the strictest, possibly the strictest measures in Europe. I don't, they, they were really strict. We basically went into full lockdown, like within a day. And all the decisions were taken by a crisis committee, which was not, which was not based on any law or anything. It was basically extra legal. Uh, but it took all the decisions and it was always just, you know, proposed by the prime minister, we are going to do it like this and we, it is not to be discussed because we need to battle the coronavirus, which is obviously very bad for democracy. But on the other hand, um, we've, we've, we've done a great job when it comes to victims and, and infected people because basically there's, I think, I don't even know the number, but there's about 35 people in the whole country who died due to coronavirus and there's about 1,300 infected people. So that's basically like nothing. So I think, I think that's a very interesting question is whether, whether, the, whether these very strict central laws, central decisions taken by the central government are not uh, really, I, I think they're quite effective. While, while I admire the, 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 the US system of, you know, the federal and the state and local governments, uh, here in Slovakia, the central government with the very strict measures and possibly extra legal moves, they have basically done very well when it comes to the virus. Okay. Thank you. That's that's another interesting case. Uh, uh, I mean, and point whether whether centralization is more effective in uh, in case of crisis like uh, COVID. So um, we are almost out of time. So uh, I will ask just people who ask for uh, to 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 make a comment to make it uh, to keep it very very brief so we can stay more or less on schedule and it's. Uh, now it's uh, uh, Elżbieta Korolczuk, please. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this interesting discussion. Um, I, th I would like to follow up on what you said, Jacek, about you know two ways in which we can think about this uh, local, uh, national, or federal uh, relationship. One is. Uh, the question of how to oppose um, authoritarian power from the local level, and that. Part of the answer is um, um, the, the the way in which uh, Fidesz sort of built up this power during those eight years from the ground up, in a way. Um, the second is how to turn those local uh, municipalities or or, um, or big cities into sort of hubs of opposition um, against um, um, against uh, authoritarianism, um, and that's another type of question. And we see a lot of efforts from um, national from the national level to restrict power, restrict funding, um, or to make those um, local governments, municipalities uh, be more burdened with the costs of specific types of crisis. But I was thinking about the third element and I was wondering uh, how it would fit into that because I think that we are not really um, talking about this more cultural dimension and I think about this um, polarization between urban and uh, rural, between um, cosmopolitan and sort of local, locally rooted national, which is very um, 
much used by authoritarian powers, uh, both in US and in Poland and many other countries, to create this sense of polarization and difference on which they try to um, gain more followers, more uh, political support. And the question is how to uh, make sense of this differentiation, how to use, for example, local uh, municipalities or big cities as centers of power without strengthening this cultural narrative that the populists are using, that, you know, that there is this strong division. And uh, I'm thinking about, uh, for example, Norris and Inglehart book about, you know, how now the sort of left-right uh, division has changed into um, sort of conservative populist versus cosmopolitan liberal. And this is very much connected to the division between urban and local. So I'm wondering, you know, what we do about this if we want to use, for example, um, um, municipalities or big cities as the centers of opposition. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think very, very relevant about the possibility that, that uh, of strengthening the rural urban divine, I think another uh, question. I, I have a line of people who want to make comments or intervene uh, and I'm really, uh, we are already behind the schedule. So I, I think I will ask everyone uh, to basically remember the comment and uh, I will call for a break now and uh, so to stay on schedule and hopefully everyone who, who, who wanted to, to comment on this topic will, will have uh, a chance in the final session for today that Elżbieta Matynia will moderate so I will sort of <laughs> I hand over the responsibility for that. <laughs> so thank you all very much. I, I think it was a great session and let's have a very short break uh, and, and be back here soon for the, for the last session.